So I'm sure most of you are aware of constellations. You know, you have your Sagittarius, Scorpius, Capricornus, and so on and so forth. But to NASA scientists, these are usually known as the optical constellations. Something that's only visible in the optical light. But if you've been watching a lot of videos on this channel, you're probably aware that we also have the infrared map of the universe, we have the microwave map, the radio map, x-ray map, and more excitingly, the gamma ray map. In other words, the actual night skies will look completely different in various frequencies. You can learn more about these maps in some of the previous videos in the description, but today we're focusing on new discoveries in the gamma ray frequencies. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and so today we're going to be discussing the potential solution to the Fermi bubble mystery. The strange bubbles, discovered back in 2010 by the gamma ray telescope known as Fermi, they discovered these unusual structures emanating from the center of the galaxy. But before we talk about the mystery and the explanation, let me actually just go back to that map I showed you previously. So this map right here that was made by NASA a few years ago. And here we have optical constellations, but we also get gamma ray constellations. Basically, in the last few years, the scientists have also proposed a bunch of gamma ray constellations only visible in the gamma ray light. But in this case, because these are modern constellations, for the most part, they have really geeky, really nerdy, and somewhat funny names. And by the way, this is an actual thing. This actually exists. The link for this is in the description below. So here we have the Fermi constellation, named after the Fermi satellite. But as you can see next to it, we have the Targus constellation. Hopefully, I don't have to explain where this is from. Right above it, we have the Hulk, we have the Eiffel Tower, the Little Prince, the Obelisk, Saturn V rocket, and my favorite, the Godzilla. Sort of looks like this in the actual constellation, and this is with the artwork. There are a bunch of other ones, some of them are really funny, once again in the description, but the point here is that we've discovered so many different gamma ray objects that the scientists had to start proposing different names in order to identify them easier. Starship Enterprise, for example. But by looking at this with more sensitivity, we'll actually start seeing something a little bit different. Here's roughly what you see with the diffuse gamma ray light. And notice how there are these two unusual structures going below the galaxy and above the galaxy itself. Or let's be more specific here. Covering the Mjörnir constellation, the Tardis constellation, the Fermi satellite constellation, and the right hand of the Hull constellations. And that's what we call the Fermi bubbles. But more intriguingly, by looking at these structures in other light, the scientists started to discover other formations as well. This is in the X-rays, suggesting that these structures are very likely connected. And in this case, this was only discovered back in 2020, 10 years later. And so almost right away to the scientists, this implied one thing. Something extremely powerful must have happened in the center of the Milky Way to produce these formations. And because a lot of similar formations have been observed in other galaxies, what many of them already explained very thoroughly, the origin here was most likely due to the supermassive black hole right in the center of the Milky Way. And so that's what the scientists have believed for the past 12 to 13 years. But it wasn't entirely clear what produced this though. It was not really argued that these were from the central black hole, but the actual event was not clear. For example, was this some kind of a tidal disruption event where a star comes really close to the black hole and becomes absorbed in the process? Or was this something related to much longer events, such as the ones we usually observe from radio galaxies, or maybe something entirely different, producing various galactic winds? So the actual origin of Fermi bubbles was not entirely clear. But because gamma rays are generally produced by extremely powerful events, whatever caused it had to be very powerful as well. And this is like 50,000 light years across, and visible in both gamma rays and X-rays. So there's a lot of energy involved here. So what exactly could have happened here around the central black hole to produce all of this? And in the past, several scientists have tried to answer this question, but their answers were not super conclusive. This time though, this Japanese scientist decided to try to answer this by using a combination of modeling, simulations, and of course mathematics, in order to provide us with a relatively good answer, and actually a potentially important answer that we need to consider. So here's what he discovered. His explanations and his modeling actually explains both the gamma ray and the X-ray emissions. And he found that all of this seems to be caused by fast-moving wind slamming into the gas in the galaxy that ends up producing very specific shock waves through the collision of charged particles with the interstellar medium. And as these shock waves bounce around, they create a lot of reverse shock waves that then heat up the material and produce the X-rays and the gamma rays observed. With a lot of this new data coming from the Japanese Suzaku satellite, that provided even more X-ray data. 
And when tracing all of this back in time to the source, it becomes clear what most likely produced this. Long-lasting galactic winds with the expelled material moving at the speed of about 1000 km per second, but lasting for about 10 million years at least. And that's why of course these bubbles are about 50,000 light years across, and why we're still seeing the emissions even today. This is basically a result of about 10 million years of activity. However, when he tried to reproduce the same effects by using just one collision or some kind of a tidal disruption event, or essentially when a star gets destroyed by a black hole and produces really powerful emissions for a relatively short time, he was not really able to reproduce the same observations, meaning that the Fermi bubbles are not likely created by something like this. And so if not tidal disruption events, it had to be much longer galactic winds that we've seen from so many different galaxies already. And if the scientist in this case is correct, it suggests that all of this very likely finished relatively recently, within the last few million years, and possibly even within the last three million years. Which of course has a bit of an implication on what effects this might have had on the atmosphere of planet Earth. For example, is there any way we can maybe explain some of the previous climatic changes by the detection coming from the Milky Way center? Although it's actually important to understand that galactic winds can be caused by at least two separate events. In this case, you're looking at M82, an iconic galaxy with visible galactic winds. But the galactic winds here are not caused by the central black hole. They're caused by a dramatic increase in starburst activity, various stars being created, exploding as supernova, and creating extremely powerful pressure events that end up pushing a lot of the gas into the intergalactic space. Something that could have happened in the Milky Way galaxy as well, and so it's not super clear if the Fermi bubbles were produced by the black hole or by some kind of an increase in star forming activity. But if this was produced by a black hole, it means that Sagittarius A star's supermassive black hole can occasionally become super active, potentially consuming huge amounts of gas coming from somewhere else in the central galaxy and doing so for at least 10 million years. And so exactly what caused the galactic wind is not super clear just yet. Nevertheless, these events are usually really important for the galactic evolution. They tend to distribute a lot of materials throughout the galaxy and also regulate star formation in other regions. Sometimes they can stop star formation, sometimes they can create pressure waves to start star formation somewhere else. And at the same time, it blows a lot of material into the halo of the galaxy, which sometimes returns back into the galaxy later on, providing more materials to the outskirts or starting more star formation in farther away regions. And so it's actually a super complicated process that the scientists still don't really understand really well, but it's something that's definitely going to affect the galaxy in the next few millions of years. Although in this case, because the wind was extremely slow and steady, and also because it seems to emanate in two separate directions, kind of similar to a typical black hole emission, it's a lot more likely that all of this was probably caused by Sagittarius A star. It's obviously not clear where all of this material came from, but it must have come from somewhere. And here you had to have a lot of material to feed the black hole. Remember, this lasted for 10 million years. And the wind is still traveling away from the center even today, with a velocity of about 1000 km per second. So definitely a pretty good explanation. But now I'm genuinely curious what effects this might have had on planet Earth, if any. And more intriguingly, if this is a galactic wind, it probably also came toward planet Earth as well. I mean, the distance from the top to the bottom here is about 25,000 light years, and the distance from the central black hole to planet Earth is around the same as well. And so it would definitely be interesting to find out what effects, if any, this would have on our planet. But today, Sagittarius A star is a really timid, really quiet black hole, compared to the ones in other galaxies. And so whatever caused the Fermi bubbles seemed to be a rare and unusual event. But we're probably not going to know much more until future studies or until future discoveries in potentially other frequencies or with other telescopes. And so until then, thank you for watching, check out all of the relevant links in the description below, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.